Welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and my pronouns are she and her. In this episode, we'll discuss the sixth Sunday after Epiphany, also known as Lectionary 6, which this year falls on February 13th. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. So our deep dive for today is on blessings and curses. And what are blessings and curses, especially in the biblical sense? Because the way that we use the word blessing these days and the way that the Bible uses it are a little different. So I think one of the first things we should discuss is the hashtag blessed, uh, which <laughs> you will find all over social media, whether you want to or not, and attached to a lot of very different things. Mm -hmm. And not as much lately, which is good. Well, I'm yeah, it seems to have backed off a little bit. I imagine that might have to do with the pandemic, <laughs> uh, which might <laughs> not be not great. not quite so blessed. But the thing is, is that blessings in the biblical sense are not prosperity gospel. The idea that you won the lottery is not something that God did for you. The idea that your favorite sports team won their game is probably also not something God did for you. Probably also not something God cares about. I mean, God might have enjoyed the game. I don't know. But, but blessings are not about the little or convenient things in our lives that, well, you know, sometimes great and really enjoyable, there's nothing wrong with enjoying those things, are not actually gifts given to us directly from God. God may enjoy the sense of humor involved in the ancient beloved prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, please save me a parking place. <laughs> Which, come to think of it, I think might be the only prayer I've ever heard my mom say out loud. Oh, but wow. <laughs> but God doesn't actually care about... But no, God does not actually care about your parking place. On the other hand, my mom's favorite hymn is definitely Mercedes Benz by Janis Joplin. So that also makes a lot of sense. But <laughs> That's fair. My dad's prayer, the prayer that my dad has prayed is, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, bless the one who eats the most. So... <laughs> Between, yes. between your mom and my dad, we got all the bad <laughs> yeah, prayers right covered. There. Yeah. So as we, we of course, have lots of examples, both culturally and biblically, of blessings and curses and the complexities that they contain. So one example is in Shrek. And I really love the example in Shrek because in Shrek, Princess Fiona is quote-unquote, cursed to look ogre-ish, like Shrek does naturally, because Shrek is an ogre. And yeah. she has to, like, I don't know, get married by a certain time or something. I don't remember exactly. But in order to break the curse. And it's one of those things that, like, in the daytime, she looks pretty, and at night, she looks like an ogre or some, like, a, like a, a stereotypical human in the daytime and an ogre at night. So to b break the curse, she has to get married or some, and they have to kiss or something like that. And I'm sure it has yeah, to do with true something love. about that. And so finally, when she does get married to Shrek and they kiss, she actually becomes an ogre full time. And so the thing that was initially viewed as a curse, making her an ogre at night, becomes actually the blessing that like that is her truer form and her fuller form. Yeah. A couple of days ago, I was helping with a confirmation lesson on relationships and the Bible, uh, all kinds of relationships, but including rom romantic ones. And we asked the students for uh, fictional examples of actually like good romantic love. Uh, and Shrek was the very first hmm. example that came up because they love each other for who they actually yeah. are. That's awesome. And that was really yeah. nice. So TV Tropes, which is a website I mention on a fairly regular <laughs> basis because I find it super useful, has a page for Cursed with Awesome, which involves someone having a curse that happens to work out really well for them. Like, for example, Batman, who is rich and powerful and very strong and a good fighter and all that and treats all of it like a curse because 
okay, yeah, it sort of got his parents <laughs> killed. Like, personally speaking, the way that that all went down, it sounds like if they had been, like, upper middle class and not super rich, they still would have probably gotten mugged, but whatever. I mean, and also, like, the bat thing in the well. Yeah, I suppose. There's that. I, it depends on which version of Batman and, and ba which backstory exactly oh, you're that. going with. Because goodness knows the one in the Christian Bale movies is not 100% uh, according to uh, the like ancient comics yeah canon, i don't or know the comic the, the animated version which like for me the animated batman is the one true batman uh, <laughs> if Mar if the joker is not played by mark hamill i refuse to acknowledge it <laughs> but but they also on tv tropes have a page for being blessed with suck <laughs> when you have a blessing that has completely ruined your life like Elsa in Frozen, who thinks of her powers as a curse for most of the movie because she doesn't understand how they work, and they almost kill her sister a couple of times, so that's probably fair. Yeah. Uh, but they turn out to be awesome once she actually knows what she's doing. And I think one of the things that I really like, and this is a spoiler if by now you still haven't seen Frozen 2, is that at the end, the blessing... Right, they're clearly identified as a blessing and she experiences them as a blessing. And the idea is to be a bridge between humans and the spirit world. And then it is reframed even. And Anna, who has never been characterized as being blessed with any special gift, though she is like one of the solidest, <laughs> best characters. She cares about everyone yeah. so much all the time. It's got to be exhausting. Oh, for sure. I <laughs> But, like, then Elsa points out that it's not just that her mom was blessed with her, but her mom was blessed with two daughters to bridge that gap. Yeah. And so it's actually that both of them together bridge the gap between the humans and the spirit world. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's a, like, blessed with suck and also blessed with nothing, but it's not actually nothing. Blessed with being herself. Yeah. Anna is honestly probably better at ruling the kingdom than Elsa was because she's not distracted by building literal castles in the air all the time. <laughs> exactly. And speaking with being blessed to be yourself, Encanto is a great example of this. And so this is definitely spoilers for anybody who has not yet seen the movie. Kay has kind of given up on the idea of it not being spoiled at this point, I think. Of basically anything while we do this podcast, but that's fine. I'll I'll get to the movie soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's just been a heck of a couple of It's still weeks. cute, even when you know so, how it goes. But yeah. the idea at the beginning of the movie is that the whole family is blessed with different magical gifts because of this one thing that happened and the love between the grandmother, Abuela, in the family and her husband, who kind of gave his life in a, like, I'm going to go fight them and hold them off. Well, you all flee. And so that love created magic in this candle that has been burning ever since. So everybody gets a gift. And it could be weather control. It could be hearing. It could be strength. It could be a lot of things. But Mirabelle, the main character, doesn't get a gift. Or so we're told. And the reality is that like her gift is compassion. It is not an official magical gift, but she is the one who brings the whole family together. And so she has this like blessing that is also a curse that she is the outcast, like she's not outcast, but she is the one in the family who feels so alone, as does Bruno, because his gift is prophecy and that oh, has some bad stuff happen. Um, yeah. But it is this like, is it a blessing? Is it a curse? And there's a point at which, and Luisa's song is the main place where it comes down is like, is this a blessing or is there so much pressure put on each of these characters to be or do a certain thing according to their gift that they don't have space to be themselves? And so it's a really great. So it sounds like they could use the blessing of good boundaries. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it does, it is like, it is a thing where the story is a journey of figuring out like, what is blessing? What is curse? And how are those not clear? Right? How is that a false binary? Yeah. That something is either blessing or a curse? Because either can get out of control. Yeah. Like we said at the beginning, what are blessings from God? Like, really, when you get down to it. And as I was thinking about this and looking especially at our gospel text for today, I was thinking that you can tell that a blessing comes from God when 
that blessing is helping you to love other people more or helping you to help mm -hmm. other people more. Whereas, for example, if you're saying, oh, hashtag blessed, I just won the lottery. You know, it actually turns out that we've done studies on this and great wealth makes you less empathetic to others, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's probably not the kind of blessing God's going to give you. Like, on the other hand, if I saw hashtag blessed more often with like, hooray, we were able to give out more at the food pantry today, that that would be cool. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. By all means. Also, and we're going to get more into this a little later too, we noticed that, especially in the gospel reading, the blessings are things that are given to those who are suffering. They are given to balance out, uh, it seems like, the, the suffering that people have experienced. God doesn't go around in the Bible promising people with awesome lives more blessings. Like that isn't really a thing that happens. Whereas mm -hmm. God is constantly going around promising blessings to people whose lives have just sucked. <laughs> and that happens over and over again. Yeah. And so that then raises the question, of course, of what are woes or curses, depending on which Bible verses we're talking sure. about, right? And to be perfectly clear, in like in a biblical sense, curses are not punishment. They're not God being like, you are terrible. I don't like you. They're not like, no. they're not trials that God tries to put us through to prove our worth. This gets a little complicated, as we'll talk about in the example. Yeah, I have tried to give God a list of people to smite, and that has yet to work out. So, yeah, there I'm are actually saying. like some places in in the Psalms, especially that like Psalm one thirty nine, I love, but the ending is like people trying to get God to wreak havoc and vengeance on their enemies. It's a prayer. Yeah. It doesn't mean God's gonna say yes yeah. and do it. Sometimes God's answer is no. Yep. And so in that sense, a lot of times I think actually woes or curses are natural consequences. If you're exploiting people, eventually there's going to be a consequence and it's not going to be good for you. Yeah. And that, and that kind of contributes to what you were saying, right, about blessings being a balancing thing. So are curses. When we look at our gospel reading, that's what it is. It's, all right, you've gotten all this comfort now. That's not going to be the case forever. Yeah. And I think it's also important to note when we're talking, especially biblically, about blessings and curses, that the Bible is written by humans. It means that we are, no matter what, always interpreting things. And so it's entirely possible that we will interpret God punishing us or some a curse as like God's punishment or God's test or yeah. something that it's not. And I think a lot of the time it's it's intended to be a warning for the coming changes. So that's like, hey, if you're economic if you're exploiting people, woe to you who exploit people. And that even like creates a chance for us to change our ways. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. If if God says woe to you, it's like Jonah's prophesying. <laughs> Jonah gets like the worst sermon and basically says, Woe to you, Nineveh. Your city will be overthrown. And then it works and then he's angry. And, and it's then it hilarious. works. And the city is not overthrown. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like I wanna throw out there too, specifically when we when we talk about woes and curses in the Bible. Yes, Emily and I both realize that there are times in the Bible that talk about God actually smiting people. But the thing about that is that God then immediately tells other people, by the way, I smited that dude. And it's that second part about God telling people that hasn't happened in the last couple thousand years. And so we don't say that God causes suffering because if God was doing that, according to the Bible, God would be telling us and very possibly on a large scale to make sure we understood that. Mm -hmm. But there's, there are complexities with attributing today blessings or curses to God. Yeah. The example that constantly gets thrown at me as a pastor in the ELCA is that on the day that the ELCA National Assembly, our, our national governing body that meets every few years. <laughs> Sorry, I just think you know like, what I'm going to say. Hilarious. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, on the day that they voted to ordain people in same sex relationships, a bolt of lightning. Yes 
hit the church i think across the street wasn't it yeah uh, the, I think the church was, where like, they'd had the worship service were, like, but doing, then the yeah. the meetings were actually in the convention center across the street and that's yeah. where they were when the lightning happened okay yes that is true that did happen on that day i don't it wasn't like at that particular moment or anything it, it wasn't spectacular that way but yes that did happen you know what else probably happened that day babies were born people had birthday cakes uh, somebody you know got their first car i don't know it, lots of exciting things happened that day probably also in that neighborhood i'm sure a lot of people were you know really delighted that day somebody probably got married maybe they were gay i I don't know <laughs> but <laughs> like well and like so the lightning struck the church yeah nobody died from it yeah no one was hurt there like, wasn't an extraordinary fire that burned the building down right for anybody that like wants to say that it's god's judgment i will counter with what if it's god's exclamation point <laughs> like heck yes exactly. you did <laughs> the fire of the holy spirit uh, yes absolutely <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So uh, be careful of trying to say that God did this or that to somebody else, because eventually someone's going to look at you when you do that and say, well, God clearly was trying to punish mm -hmm. you with that haircut or something. And, yeah. it, <laughs> and it's like, you're not going to appreciate that either. And it can be really harmful spiritually to think oh, about terribly. Yes. God, right? Like your family member being sick with cancer is not a punishment from God. No, absolutely not. And it's if you say this works. crap to children, by the way, like God might not smite you, but if I hear about it, I'm going to ha come have a long, boring lecture that you are going to hate mm -hmm. yeah. and you're not going to enjoy that. So it, it might not be God smiting that you need to worry about. <laughs> I'm just saying, -ha 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 like, -ha -ha. I'm, I am not threatening Watch violence. Nerds at church like starts <laughs> doing long, boring lectures. Like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to violently smite you. I'm just going to, you know, I, I had a line that I said to somebody on Facebook a couple years ago of, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I will defend long past the point of anyone else being interested, your right to say it. And like, I know what I'm good at. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, if you want to become our a Patreon supporter at like 15 or 20 bucks a month, <laughs> we will prepare a recording for you. Of about, a lecture like this. Yeah, a lecture like this. A lecture explaining why some terrible theology is awful and should never be ta taught to kids. And, and it's bad. How and you should dare you? And yes. yes, we are happy to uh, do that for our $20 Patreon supporters. So <laughs> now's your chance. This is a special. We probably won't remember this unless you remind <laughs> us after the next couple of weeks. But if you do it yeah. in the next, if you become a Patreon supporter in the next couple of weeks, we will so do that in the month of February. Oh, That's our goodness. Patreon special for you. Actually, let's put a, a end date on that. It has to be before Ash Wednesday, because I feel like preparing something like that on Ash Wednesday is asking to get spited by God. Like, Ash yeah. Wednesday is all about being humble, so let's not go there. Before Lent. Te I was going to say, technically Lent begins in March, so we're yes. good. Yeah, that's yeah. your deadline. Yeah. No, February. We're just in February. February. If you become okay, a supporter sure. in February, yes. we will do this. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so biblical examples of blessings and woes. I feel like we should probably start with the book of Job because I feel like that's where people's minds are going to go. And it is the oldest book in the Bible. Yes, I wanted to bring up the book of Job was almost certainly written long before anything else in the Bible was. This is a story that probably literally all of the Jewish people in the Bible would have been familiar with. Uh, it is definitely a parable. God did not actually make a bet with Satan. I'm sure that if God was going to make a bet with Satan, it would be a little more interesting than this. But yeah, let's, let's not take the book of Job literally. There are some lovely lessons about things not to say to your friends when they're suffering from the book of Job. That's excellent. But when we talk about blessings as things that help you love more and help more and woes as things that cause you to be less able to love and less able to help, actually the book of Job is not a terrible example uh, because all of the terrible things that happened to Job, like 
they make it more difficult for him to love people. They make it more difficult for him to help people than he could have before uh, because he's in so much pain and so much grief. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that's probably fair. And then at the end of the story, when he is once again blessed, we don't actually know that he goes out and loves more people and helps more people, but he does seem to love his family and that does seem to help his family. And he's not burdened with such undue wealth that he's not capable of caring for other people. All of that seems to actually add up. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just, again, the Bible was written down by humans. We did not overhear the conversation between God and Satan that is yeah. told in that story. Well, and so. I think, I think, and you mentioned this, right, with Job as a parable, but I think the so much about Job is meant to make us think and wonder and question what we believe. And that's Absolutely. part of it. And so, like, we're kind of pulling out some woes and some blessings from in the Bible, but that's not because those are super clear cut or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My favorite woes biblically are the woes in Amos. I actually like taught a Christian education, a middle school, Sunday school on this when I was in college with Dr. Kristen Swanson. We had a class called Vocation of Religious Education. So we it was specifically designed to teach the Bible so that when people got to Luther College and took intro to the Bible, they didn't have a faith crisis. Yay! Yeah. Can we, like, put that on YouTube and make everyone watch it? Right? <laughs> but one of the things in as we were, like, teaching Amos is Amos, A, doesn't have, like, a, but it'll be okay. There's no, but it'll be okay at the end of Amos. Amos is just yeah. like, woe to you and woe to you and woe to you. But what you don't realize when you're just listening to it is that Amos is like doing a spiral and an X marks the spot. So Amos is from the Southern Kingdom and he's prophesying about the Northern Kingdom. But the like spiral in and the X mark the Northern Kingdom, the Kingdom of Israel. And so it's like it's all of these woes to all of these countries and that people are kind of used to like, woe to these other countries and so as it builds, it's like the seventh one they're like on the edge of their seat for because seven is like this really important number. And it's like a kind of boring woe. And then Amos comes back with the eighth and is like, but woe to you, Israel. And everybody's like, oh, oh mind blown. They're like, yeah. it's, it's intended, like these woes build for anticipation and point towards a larger, right? Like, Amos is talking about a larger systemic economic exploitation situation. And so there are ways in which the woes kind of feed that building and that larger issue, but then also are like very pointed at the specifics within the countries. Sure. Yeah. Another example, particularly for woes, are the Psalms of Lament, one mm -hmm. that is going to be coming up in our rotation, you might say. Mm -hmm pretty soon here during Holy Week uh, is Psalm 22, which Jesus mm -hmm. quotes from the cross. There's also the, I believe, although goodness knows our listeners are welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, the only Psalm of lament that does not end on a hopeful or grateful or like somewhat promising. upward, yeah, somewhat promising note is Psalm 88, which makes that one kind of extraordinary. Uh, all of the others that are Psalms of lament do take a uh, somewhat hopeful turn by the end, except for mm -hmm. that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's also super long, but yeah. So there is plenty of space to, to cry out, woe is me or woe is us. Or woe to you for that matter. Because a few of the you. Psalms do that too. Yeah, yeah, they do. But there's also blessings in the Bible. So when we think about Genesis 12, God promises Abraham in particular, but that means that the promise extends to both Sarah and Hagar. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So this goes back to what Kay was saying of blessings are intended so that you might bless others. Yes. They're not meant to be something that just builds up one person. It's a very much a communal focus. Yes, absolutely. So there is a passage uh, a little later in Luke 6, particularly from verses 37 and 38. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. And I love the the imagery of that verse uh, and how it uh, encourages us to be 
not only gracious but generously gracious to one another Mm. Uh, and i i definitely believe that forgiveness not only from god but also from each other uh, is a blessing yeah so that comes to mind and also speaking of things that can be blessings that you wouldn't necessarily expect a few years ago mm-hmm. i went to a bible study which shall remain nameless and huh. i was very pissed off about some of the things that were said there because they were kind of judgy and materialistic mm-hmm. and i came home and i was going to that week be preaching on this same passage from Luke for All Saints Day, uh, which I think, because this was about three years ago, I think also we should remember that while this passage comes up here, I believe it's also going to come up again for All Saints Day. So keep that in mind when you're preaching this. Don't like preach everything you have to say about this passage because you'll want some of it for All Saints Day. So I came home that day and I rewrote the passage from Luke to be more modern and more sensible to our modern ears, I suppose. Uh, So this is what I came up with. Blessed are you when you come to church looking like a mess, hoping for gas money, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when you're feeding your kids unhealthy food because it's also the cheapest and what you can afford, for you will be filled. Blessed are you when your throat closes up when you try to pray because your grief is overwhelming, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of who you welcome in the name of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets who welcomed the unwelcome before you. But woe to you who have much and give little, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you whose needs are filled and yet ignore the needs of others, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh in the face of others' suffering, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all say how nice and respectable you are, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. <laughs> That's a good one. I am still very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. So anger can sometimes be a blessing because sometimes it leads to creativity. Indeed. One of the things that I particularly appreciate about the Beatitudes, which is what this is, these blessings are specifically called, is that it's not blessed will you be, it is blessed are you. Yes, the like thing that will happen is in the future, but right now you are blessed. And I think that makes a big difference in how we think about things because Jesus, especially in Luke, cares so much about what is happening in the here and now. Yes. And again, particularly in this Luke passage, these things are balancing things out. The blessings are given to people whose lives suck. The woes are given to people whose lives are pretty awesome by our usual standards. And these things balance things out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's another version of this that's a specifically queer version of the Beatitudes that I love. It's by Mark Aguhar. And I'm not positive that I'm pronouncing that right because I don't know Tagalog pronunciations very well. But And I'm going to read the second half because instead of the woe to you, it is F you's. So we'll link to it. Apple Podcasts would not thank us for. So Yeah, we'll link to it for folks, but just so you in the episode description, but just know that it's not suitable for work. But it's blessed are the sissies. Blessed are the boy dykes. Blessed are the people of color, my beloved kith and kin. Blessed are the trans. Blessed are the high femmes. Blessed are the sex workers. Blessed are the authentic. Blessed are the disidentifiers. Blessed are the gender illusionists. Blessed are the non normative. Blessed are the gender queers. Blessed are the kinksters. Blessed are the disabled. Blessed are the hot fat girls. Blessed are the weirdo queers. Blessed is the spectrum. Blessed is consent. Blessed is respect. Blessed are the beloved who I didn't describe. I couldn't describe. will learn to describe and respect and love. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. So we'll link to that and you can look at the woe part of that as well. But I love that as well because it gives yes. this other insight. And the post that I was just reading from and that we'll link to is from right around Mark's time of death. And Mark is a trans femme Filipinx activist, artist, and writer. And so there's just this like beauty in like that particular intersectional space 
that it creates for the ways that Mark is clearly engaging with who is blessed and who yeah. is not. And now as we dive into our readings, our first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. The prophet reminds the people that humans betray and distort, but God is always faithful and trustworthy. So one of the themes in this passage is Jeremiah is using imagery from creation. And there's just like this, the way that creation is characterized is so resilient. And it reminded me of the Okavango Okavango, Okavango Delta in the Kalahari Desert. So if anybody has Disney Plus and watches the elephant documentary on it, you will mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about, especially if you've watched it multiple times like me. <laughs> so yearly, the highlands of Angola, which are like these mountain areas really high up, mm -hmm. catch all of the water that's coming from the Atlantic. And there's huge amounts of rain. And so that goes down and spreads and floods the Okavango Delta. So it goes through the Kalahari Desert and floods the Okavango Delta. And there's this like, in the documentary, they have it like depicted just from like artistry. But there's all of this that goes from like yellowish brown desert to like lush greens and all of this that looks so dead and yet is brimming with life where crocodiles will swim upstream and animals and plants have like buried themselves in the mud to keep themselves alive and safe. And then the water washes away the mud. And so then they have this space for life and water and all of that stuff. And it's, it's beautiful, but I love that like that challenge to right the time of drought and those sorts of things when in fact there is a drought it's a desert and yet there is that space that still happens where there is so much life and so much greatness and realistically yeah. our you know manicured lawns have less biodiversity than the desert so there's also that <laughs> yeah and then when we jump into the verses in verse five we read Thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. So due to a recent New York Times opinion piece, and by the way, if we have any New York Times opinion editors listening, I would like to say, please find some progressive Christians to write for you occasionally. We do exist mm -hmm. and, and you never seem to. Both Kay and I would probably be, I don't know if you are, but I'd be oh, happy sure. to help you out there in New York Look, Times. Even if I'm not the one who you want to write for you, I can help you find people. Mm -hmm. I volunteer, <laughs> you might say. <laughs> Moving on. My part of social media has recently been very focused on talking about ableism and faith, in part because of this opinion piece, which I'm not going to go further into because I'd rather subtweet than give that more attention. And <laughs> one regular comment uh, in these conversations about ableism has been that even those of us who are currently able-bodied can't count on the idea that we always will be. Therefore, we should treat ourselves as being temporarily able-bodied. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all. And so today, I and by today, I mean literally this morning, I can't you know necessarily say that this was a blessing from the Holy Spirit, but by golly, it's handy. Mm -hmm. I was listening to an episode of Three Black Halflings, which is a podcast about D&D &D and diversity that I really enjoy. And, uh, this episode was from quite a while ago. I am catching up on their back catalog. And it introduced the project D&D &D Disability, which is a website that offers ways that you can play neurodiverse and disabled characters in D&D. &D. And they have quite a few different ways you can do this yeah i just saw a thing about that on social media so unless you posted that it, that might have been me okay. <laughs> I, I did post that to social media yes but also you can play a character with chronic fatigue or chronic pain or a ptos or mm -hmm. a character who is uh, autistic or has adhd i'm gonna look into that one myself and a bunch of other options they have a bunch of items that have been created that you can have in D&D, like stim items for people with ADHD or mm -hmm. weighted blankets or uh, any number of other things and all the various stats you would need uh, and how to have those in D&D. I believe they also on the website, which we will link to in the episode description, link to other people who have uh, created uh, various things. There is definitely a combat wheelchair I heard about several times. Nice and uh, some other options so it it sounds pretty great and i personally am looking forward to looking into it more deeply after we finish recording and i have a little free time yeah i am excited about it too it sounds really cool i'll just say in my own subtweeting of the new york times article 
that, and we as a podcast, I think I can speak for both of us when we say this, that community that gathers virtually and engages virtually is true community. Church that gathers virtually, that worships virtually is true church. We're a, we're a podcast. Like if we don't believe that, then what are we doing? So for that matter, I live in a fairly rural area of Southern Minnesota. And if I didn't have online friends, my own age, then I wouldn't have any friends, my own age. So yeah, that is super real. Yep. And then in verse seven, we read, blessed are those who trust in the becoming one whose trust is the becoming one. And this reminded me actually of a lot of what I have gathered from folks who are in 12-step programs, like Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, which is for people who have partners who are alcoholics or addicts, partners or family members. So like that sort of thing is like, this is talking about the higher power, right? That's step one is the naming powerlessness, naming that we need a higher power and for some people it's god and for some people it's a higher moral authority or community or that sort of thing but it is but naming that like fierce independence which we are so oversaturated with in this country is actually not a good thing it actually makes yeah. it really hard for people to begin recovery to find balance like any of those things so yeah yeah i just I was like, ah, it's it's a higher power 12-step thing. Yeah. And then in the first part of verse 8, we read, They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. And the image that came to mind for me was when in Black Panther, um, when King T'Challa goes into the like alternate space where he... After they make him lose powers to fight for the kingship, then he gets the then they, he gets the powers back. But that space of like he he's in a vision or something, but yeah. it's for him it is this tree of his ancestors of the Black Panthers who have gone before him of his dad and his grandfather, and this tree is just like solidly there in the midst of like maybe a little bit of like brush type stuff but it's like a tree and that is kind of it and it just yeah it's not planted by water but it is a tree planted by a different kind of water and nourished by the ancestors yeah yeah and then i read the second part of that verse uh and uh it shall not fear when the heat comes and its leaves shall stay green in the year of drought it is not anxious and it does not cease to bear fruit and so I read that and I thought, so deep roots aren't reached by drought either. Just like Aragorn in Lord of the Rings reminds us that deep roots are not reached by the frost mm-hmm. uh, in his poem about all that is gold does not glitter. Isn't that a song? I think it's also a song. All I, that I think glitters it, yeah. isn't, is not gold. What yeah. song is that? All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. I used to know the whole the whole thing. Uh, it's the prophecy about his sword Mm, yeah that's in the books not in the movie yeah probably sure but there is an all that glitters isn't gold song by lou christie okay by lou christie so that's what i was thinking of when you were talking about lord of the rings no sure yes but yeah so yes yeah i'm now irritated that it took me that long to think of the whole thing but anyway moving on but it but it is it is true it's not impacted by frost or yeah not as deep roots not as impacted by drought but they That's are impacted are by frost. Trees are impacted by them, just not the roots. Because otherwise we wouldn't have maple syrup. And maple syrup is amazing. Yes. I'm not sure that Aragorn knew about maple syrup. Like, I, I did not he did. see He's a king. maples, trees in Lord of the Rings. Details, but... details. <laughs> How could you not know about maple syrup? It's amazing. J.R.R. Tolkien took all of that time to describe all of those trees to us in such extraordinary detail. And none of them, none of them were maples. I'm just saying. So I think if Aragorn had known about maple trees, we would have heard about those in exhausting detail as well. I mean, only because J.R.R. Tolkien is weird. I stick by my Some people like their trees. That's okay. Yes. And the whole point of the Lord of the Rings is details. It's true. That's like all the the trees. trees. And the trees. <laughs> and the details about the trees. Mm-hmm. Okay. Our second reading for today is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 20. 
Paul reminds the people of Corinth that you can't believe Jesus was raised from the dead, but that we won't be because our resurrection is based in Jesus's. So one of the themes for this passage is, surprising no one, resurrection. That's like the entire Yay. passage. <laughs> so I was thinking about it. It's another little Easter Sunday for us. Indeed. I think it is interesting that that is the case when the other two readings are so focused on like the here and now of blessings and woes. Like, but when you think about it, resurrection is balancing out death. So it's all about balance. Mm, so maybe that's the actual thing today. Huh. Yeah. Fascinating. But I was thinking about it. And I was like, it has to be like a good Doctor Who. Like there has to be a good Doctor Who story about like resurrection. And I was talking to River Needham, friend of the podcast. And <laughs> she was like, um, any of the episodes with regeneration? And I was just like, yeah. Oh. Face palm. <laughs> like, of course, the entire concept of the doctor as a time lord who regenerates is, in fact, the idea of res- resurrection, the idea of having died and coming back to life in a new way. There's also, like, in Star Trek, there's a species that regenerates, but they, like, take on different bodies. Because... Sort of. I think you're talking about the trill. And mm-hmm. the trill are basically a symbiotic species of two types of beings basically one are the the ones that look like us they look like people Mm -hmm. and that's sort of half of the species and then the other half are things that we would think of as parasites except that instead of being a parasite they actually do have a symbiotic relationship of give and take and Mm -hmm. there are fewer of those and those live a very very long time by transferring from one host body to the next And so instead of exactly reincarnation or or regenerating, because they can die um, and Mm. they do sometimes, Okay. but they sort of have multiple lives by living in different host bodies. And the experience of coming into a host body changes both both the symbiote and the the person, the trill. So sort of like it's it's pretty close. But yeah, people people have like told me about that, that like I've seen that episode where there's like a trill who's in a body that's of a different gender than their original oh, yeah. body. And so like, that is the one that people tell me is like, look, it's like queer trans affirmation. Yeah. So, um, and yeah, but... there's an episode about that in next generation. And then there's a character in deep space nine that is a trill. Uh, and I won't spoil that, but Worf eventually gets involved and that's pretty awesome. Uh, and Jadzia Dax is the, the character's name. Uh, and she's also amazing. So that was great. Mm-hmm. But also, it's noted that Jadzia Dax, Jadzia is the, the person, the trill, and then the symbiote is named Dax. And so therefore, when Jadzia has the symbiote, joins with the symbiote, her name becomes Jadzia Dax. And Dax's previous host was named Curzon and was a he. And so that also happens. Okay, so when we dive into the verses, uh, when we read verse 13, we read, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. There is a lovely clip of Stephen Colbert, and I think it must have been from last night's show because it has just showed up today on Twitter that is going around of him talking about his faith and comedy and how they interact. Mm. Uh, And it's been bopping around Twitter pretty good this morning. And he has a statement uh, of death is not defeat. And then he... Uh, recites a quotation from Robert Hayden, which apparently he also tweeted out a couple of years ago uh, Mm -hmm. about death and rebirth. And it's both resonate beautifully with this verse in particular, I think. Uh, And so we can link to that clip in our episode description as well. Yes. It's very nice. Yeah. My general take on faith and comedy is if I'm not laughing, what's the point? Uh, (laughs) Yeah. He certainly mentions that he believes that God has a sense of humor. Yeah. Have you have you seen the platypus? Yeah, uh, and also that one of the uses of a sense of humor is to make us less scared of death. Mm, ooh, I like that one. Yeah. So I was looking at verses thirteen and fourteen, and they are these delightful geom- like in geometry class we learned about proofs. So they're yes. just like a bunch of proofs, right? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain. And so then you could presume that if there is no resurrection of the dead, then our proclamation has been in vain because I love math. And that was that's like how proofs work. My favorite part of the proofs. So you could do that. Or you could like do it 
in a coding sense, except they're negative, so it'd be a little bit harder. But if you wanted to code into a computer program, like, yeah, if there's no else statement. yeah, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then this thing. And if yeah. Christ is not, then this thing. Yeah. So you know, proofs in coding. It's biblical. Maybe God is the one who figured out math in the first place. Maybe God is the one who created math in the first place. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah. And if God would like to tutor some of us a little more on that, then that would be okay too. I'm just saying. I love so, math. I, I love math too. I maybe, don't claim that that means that I've always understood all of it. Maybe God has like sent people to do that tutoring. Actually, my grandpa was great at it. Do you? Actually, I was just reading a social media post the other day about how the issue that people that a lot of people have with math is not so much math itself as the horribly traumatizing way they were taught it yes. and taught to see it. And yep. that is definitely a true thing. Yeah. yeah. Verse 15 starts with, we are even found to be misrepresenting God. And who boy, uh, that's something that happens a lot. Uh, but specifically, this verse is talking about we are misrepresenting God when we say that there is no resurrection of the dead. But man, we love to misrepresent God in all kinds of different ways. Mm -hmm. And reading the stories in the Bible, I, I have to say, I don't really get how you can put limits on God. Like, are you going to say that God who created the entire universe, although not necessarily in seven 24 hour days, <laughs> God who became human and came back from the dead, God who performed various other miracles in the Bible, uh, exactly which ones you choose to take literally. We don't have to get into that conversation right now, mm -hmm. but that this amazing God and, and this Holy spirit can't work through someone who happens to be say a woman, queer, trans, disabled, etc. My imagination doesn't work that way. I don't, I can't imagine a God who is so vastly limited and yet has done so many vast and extraordinary things. Uh, and I also have to point out that that also feels like you're challenging God. <laughs> like, I don't see how you say, oh, God can't do this thing. And having read the Bible, <laughs> Do you think God's not going to take that as a challenge? <laughs> there are so many superheroes in fi in fictional worlds that I can't even begin to name them all, that if you told them that they couldn't do something, they would immediately take that as a challenge. And I definitely also see that quality in God in the Bible over and over and over again. Ha ha, I'll show you. And so, <laughs> I mean, if you want to challenge God to work through more people by doing this, that's kind of a weird way to go about it. Who am I to argue? But also maybe just try letting God work through people like God's gonna, and you don't have to traumatize people in the process. Just like you can teach people math without traumatizing people. Mm -hmm. Funny how that works. So yeah. don't misrepresent God. Yeah, agreed. And then in verse 20, we read, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. So I was thinking about who was raised from the dead, and I, as we know, am still making my way through the Buffy series. Yay! And in Buffy, the vampires, a lot of times, are raised from the dead. So they actually, like, are dead or buried. Not all of them. Some of them just immediately turn into vampires. But I think if the vampire, yes. like, sucks too much of their blood and then gives them blood to suck, and then it's a slower yeah, process and or something. I mean, even outside of Buffy, there are various bits of vampire lore that do involve you probably looking dead enough to get buried first for a while. Yeah. So I was just thinking about vampires, but also a shout out to Horror Nerds at Church. So for those of you who know about our sister podcast, Horror Nerds at Church, Pace Warfield May, who is the co-host, and I will be co-hosting the third season of Horror Nerds at Church, which will be a kind of mini season all about vampires. It is going to be super fun. Those of you who know, who know me at all know that I don't do horror, so there's only one actual horror movie in it. And the main, like, the main movies that we're doing are going to be the Twilight movies. That sounds hilarious. Yeah. Oh, and I have absolutely been involved in this by introducing both Emily and Pace to some fabulous parody stuff that came out on the internet about those movies when they first were released. Yes. So if you are not a fan of the movies, don't worry. We're there to tear them apart. Yes. But it's it's those movies and then it's a bunch of other ones that are going to be fun, including a couple kids movies and kids shows. 
So make sure if you haven't, you check out Horror Nerds at Church, add it to your podcasts and like their page on Facebook or follow them on Twitter. And we'll include a note in our episode description, but I am super excited to explore more of vampires. We're going to try and figure out what are the absolute essential characteristics of vampires and whether or not that includes glitter. No. Also, I realized that you guys did not expect a signed reading from me for this season, but like, congratulations, have fun. So. <laughs> and then our gospel reading for this episode is Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. Jesus heals a crowd and then begins his sermon on the plain, telling them who is blessed by God and who has woe approaching. So one of the themes in this is a clear preferential option for the poor or the oppressed which comes from liberation theology this is what the beatitudes are one of the many many biblical sources for liberation theology but i was thinking about this in terms of preferential options for like those who are most vulnerable and marginalized too and thinking about sure. captain marvel in the movie captain marvel at the end so spoilers um once she's figured out that the Kree are the actual bad ones, she's like challenging them. And they are like, well, we're just going to get rid of Earth altogether because why the heck not? And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. I shall protect them. And so she becomes the like preferential option for the poor Earthlings who don't have the technology yet. Cool. And then as we jump into the verses, we read in verse 18, they had come to hear Jesus and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. I have to admit, I never actually got into the TV show Breaking Bad, but gee, imagine a version of the show where he gets cured of cancer by a traveling faith healer in the first episode and then doesn't have to become a drug lord. Hmm. Completely different show. Or maybe just a version where, you know, health insurance in this country is not horrifying and therefore he still doesn't have to become a drug lord. Hmm. Always a possibility. Yeah. Just say he, you know, doesn't have to break bad. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe we have manufactured these problems ourselves. Mm. And then in verse 21, we read, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And I was thinking about the those who are hungry for you will be filled and in the movie hook but also this comes from like peter pan tradition the sure. lost boys don't have food but they because of their imaginations create this enormous feast and that actually becomes good and tasty food that they get to eat and so they actually like are both hungry now and then become filled and it's because of the imagination that they are blessed with. Yes. It's one of my favorite scenes too. In the hook. And then in verse 24, we read, but woe to you who are rich for you have received your consolation. And okay. Yes. I probably could take a pot shot at like Tony Stark or Batman or somebody else rich in fiction, <laughs> but honestly, they're trying to help. So like, I have to say that my first thought for this verse was less them and more Jeff Bezos paying the city of Rotterdam to partially deconstruct a historic bridge so that he can get his giant new super yacht out of their city and into the ocean when there's a pandemic and you know millions of people are going without and he could help them and he's not and yeah. meanwhile his ex-wife is giving like oodles of money to all kinds of useful causes so like do with that what you will I guess yeah but speaking of having more money making you less empathetic to others, huh? Huh. Woe to yeah. you, Jeff Bezos. That's a lot of consolation. And also several yachts. Yeah. <laughs> I read verse 25 and where Jesus says, Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. And the in the image in my head is actually like a cinematic technique that I don't even know where I have gotten it from it might be a like combination of different cinematic techniques but the space of like those who are laughing now where like you see like a scene of jolliness and laughter and it's in color and everybody's smiling and then it's like slows the film slows down and turns to black and white and they just like sink into this grief or hardship or something and so that's like well, or sometimes yeah like sometimes when you slow the film down, their expressions of laughter or joy are revealed to be like horrific and terrifying mm -hmm. and not genuine joy. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. 
So this episode is also our Patreon thank you episode because we want to say thank you to our Patreons every quarter. And goodness knows our blessings uh, here on the podcast are our Patreon supporters and we are deeply grateful for you. And so I would like to say a big thank you to Bridget Watley, our very first Patreon supporter ever, Mm -hmm. uh, who we are very grateful for. Yes, thank you, Bridget. And I will say uh, thank you especially to Pace Warfield, who is our other Patreon supporter and the gift that they are to us and as our sister podcast co-host. Absolutely. Thank you, Pace. Patreon, it makes a huge difference for us, for Kay and I and our ability to do this podcast. We mentioned in our mini-sode, if you check it out from November and we'll link in the episode description. It's also easy to find because it's the only one with the Pride logo when you look through the different changing Ooh, logos of the show. It's true. It is the only Pride logo one. But we mentioned the cost of doing a podcast. Right now, I do not have um, like gainful. I'm not gainfully employed. And Kay. That is such a capital term. Right. But yes. Both Kay and I started this without paying jobs. And so this is a definite labor of love, but also it costs us money to do. And so if you are able to help support us and help cover some of the costs of this or even cover potential costs for us to be able to do things like transcripts or not stress so much about not having enough money, become a Patreon supporter. You get access to a bunch of stuff. There's a $5 tier and a $10 tier. And you get to show us in a very, very tangible way how much you love and appreciate us. And if you're a pastor, you can definitely use your continuing ad money for it. Yes. I will also say that we are actually getting closer to being able to do transcripts. At this point, it's less a we don't know how and more a time is a problem and we don't have enough of it kind of thing. A time and money. Because we need money and, for and money, money. yes, uh, yeah. we we will need more money for that. So so we have figured out how that could happen. We just haven't figured out how it's going to happen. If that makes any sense. Yes, but you can definitely incentivize us with your money because that will make it Absolutely. easier for us to make it happen. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Catch us next time when we'll discuss the nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the seventh Sunday after Epiphany with with our special guest Angela Cordell Rapp. This podcast has been produced by us, Kay Roloff and Emily Ewing. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Nerds at Church or contact us at nerdsatchurch at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts. We love reviews. And as we mentioned before, if you want access to uncut guest episodes and interviews, recipes from our Jesus Loves You series, live Q&As, and more, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerds at church. As the ancient Christian said, Pax Bobiscum. Bobiscum.